Copenhagen is a city of transformation. A few decades ago, it was close to bankruptcy, entirely dependent on fossil fuel, and the waterways were polluted with waste. But today, that seems like a distant memory. It has changed completely. Now you can swim in the harbour and people will stay here in summertime. Now today there are no people, almost no people, but in summertime there will be hundreds or thousands of people. Uh, so it has become some kind of new city beach in Copenhagen. Unlike Scotland, low emission zones are not a new concept in Denmark. Diesel lorries and buses have been banned from the capital since 2008. Caspar Harbo is a key figure in the municipal government and has been integral in reducing the city's emissions, which have fallen by more than 40% since 2005. He says the key to Copenhagen's success has been getting people to turn their backs on cars altogether. When we ask people why they bike in Copenhagen, they say they do it because it's fast, it's easy, it's cheap, and it's good for the health, and then comes the environment as number four or, or five. So then, of course, because there's been political will and also dedicated funds for, for, for many years um, across, um, would you say, across parties, the different parties have actually uh, agreed to, to, uh, to spend quite some money on bicycle infrastructure. More than 560 kilometres of cycle routes snake through the city, and half the working population now commute by bike. But Copenhagen is about to take its commitment to carbon neutrality a step further. Later this year, the city centre will become a zero emission zone, meaning all petrol and diesel vehicles will be banned from entering altogether. Of course there are uh, uh, people that are not uh, happy about the, the, the new, but I don't think it has been a big, uh, I don't think it has been a big issue because we've had the low emission zones zone for so many years, so I think we've just gotten used to it and I think in general also generally also uh, people are concerned about the environment are concerned about air quality but it isn't a complete success story the Danish capital had planned to become the world's first carbon neutral city in just two years time a target it's now likely to miss Norbrugge is one of Copenhagen's busiest and densely populated streets in the last few years cars have been phased out but it wasn't a popular change at the time. Like Glasgow, some feared new rules would ruin business. But years later, it seems attitudes have changed. This street has really blossomed as like a retail street, um, especially like the last years. Um, so it must be a good thing. <laughs> but it didn't happen overnight. Businesses did fail and the area changed. In effect, over time, it gentrified. I think cities have to accept that wanting change, no matter which, which way change goes, always comes with some skepticism and, and potentially, possibly resistance from, from citizens or other parties or shops and whatnot. You need to see that change and experience it before you maybe you are able to really comprehend what it, what it implies and what's, what kind of life quality that, that, comes, that it brings to you. But cycling isn't the only green way to get around the city. Everywhere you turn, there's an abundance of sustainable options. Public transport, both on land and on water, is fully electric. And the city's fully automated metro system is renowned for its speed and reliability. Making advantages where a car maybe have to go on a detour and you give the right of way or the, 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 the direct travel route for walking and cycling and, and public transport. So you have these time benefits. If you can make it attractive from a time perspective to, to ride your bike to a destination, it, it has to be something else than just hitting on, on money or climate change because in the end of the day, you commute the way you have set up your life. But what if people didn't have to rely on public transport as much? Many places in Scotland, including Glasgow, Edinburgh and Dundee, are all planning to build 20-minute cities. So I've come here to Copenhagen's first livable neighbourhood, built on a former industrial shipyard in the city's northern edge. It's a place that residents can get everything they need, from office space to restaurants and shops, in just five minutes. Norham is already home to some 5,000 people. By 2050, it will cover 4 million square metres, 
and accommodate 40,000 inhabitants and 40,000 workplaces. Yeah, this is a very large post-industrial site, a very uh, big area. So the concept was to actually dig a lot of canals and then we have a series of islets that can be then turned into individual districts and you can take them one by one and you can finish a, a neighborhood and then you can move on to the next and you can build that neighborhood and it will create a small community where people live and people work and you have uh, cultural facilities, you have schools and uh, daycare and so forth, Every, everything you need uh, within a short walking distance. Catherine Maxwell has studied how both Scotland and Denmark approach their climate targets. She says low emission zones are just the start of what needs to change in Scotland. A key challenge for Glasgow will be around developing an integrated transport system. It's not joined up at the moment. It needs to be as convenient as you know getting in your car and, and being able to drive across town. Catherine says we can learn a lot from Copenhagen's approach, but is the Danish capital as green as its reputation? They have really pushed that level of ambition a lot further than most other cities. I would say that it's always a, a risk to do that, but it can pay off because even if you don't reach that specific target, you'll be a lot closer than you think 